just guessing here, but it might have become apparent that the preacher is not here. <laughs> she, uh, she, she decided to go up to Maine to visit family for Mother's Day, and I, I can't wait to tell her I didn't even know anybody lived in Maine. So. <laughs> Actually, I think it's time to reprise my story about substituting for a minister. And it's not really my story, except it was given to me by Bill Ruff. I hope a lot of people remember Bill Ruff, who was a minister in this district for a long time, district superintendent in the 70s, a wonderful man. And he gave me this story about a, a substitute for coming to see to, to take care of the preacher and the in the preacher's absence. And uh, it was a last minute thing, apparently. And so this guy showed up out in front of the church and nobody knew he was coming. And a woman in front of the church met him out there and introduced herself, not knowing who it was. And he says, well, I'm, I'm actually here at the last minute to substitute for your minister. And she said, oh, okay. So they, <clears throat> they started going in and a little boy, a little tiny boy on the steps of the church says, what does that mean, substitute? And uh, so, and you know how preachers are. They don't like to answer directly, so we want to think of an illustration of some sort. <laughs> so he said, substitute. He said, you see that window over there and how it's got some divisions in it? Each one of those divisions is known as a window pane. And he said, if it gets broken or something, then you tack a piece of wood or cardboard or something in its place until you can get a, a, a new pane, a new window pane to put in there. And that piece is called a substitute. And he said, oh, okay. So it, and, and apparently it worked well. They went on in. The service went well by all standards. And uh, after it was over, you know, they talked to this visiting preacher and the same woman that had met him out front said, I think you did a great job. I think the service really, really well. In fact, she says, I didn't so much see you as a substitute, but I saw you as a real pain. <laughs> <laughs> and so I've, I've decided that's sort of my goal today. I would, I would like to be remembered as, as a real pain. <clears throat> and I've chosen for reasons that will hopefully become obvious, 1 Samuel, the first chapter and the first 11 verses. Now there was a certain man of Ramatham Zophim in the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroboam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, an Ephraimite. And he had two wives, the name of one of the wives was Hannah, and the other one was Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. So it was that when they went to the house of the Lord, that her rival provoked her, and therefore Hannah wept and did not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why is it that you weep? Why did you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? So Hannah arose after they had begun their eating and drinking in Shiloh. Eli, the priest, was sitting in the seat of the tabernacle by the doorpost. And Hannah went down the hill, entered the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And she made a vow, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me 
and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. <clears throat> well, certainly there's more to the story than that, and we'll, we'll deal with that in the moments to come, and we'll take it to its logical conclusion. And, and maybe, you know, get done and get on over to Rafferty's before the Baptists do, you know. <laughs> it's, it's a really nice, comprehensive introduction, I think, in this first part of, of First Samuel, which, which tells about Elkanah, the man, and it tells about his lineage, his great, 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 fourth great grandparent and we deduce from that that he is from the house and lineage of Levi it tells about the area where they live in the um, in the Bailey's comprehensive guide to biblical pronunciation Ramathan Zopim is one word and it means near the top of the mountain so we, we can gather from that that they've built a house not far from the top of this mountain near Ramar. And you picture in your mind, it must be a nice house. I believe it's really a beautiful house. And my mind just has this great image of the house with majestic views from the front porch and the back porch for miles and miles. Very nice, happy place. And then, there's a sentence that enters the narrative with a thud. This man's got two wives. And that's just a foreign concept for us. That's not something that we're able to readily conceptualize that somebody has two wives. The name of one of his wives is Penina. She has sons and daughters. And his other wife, Hannah, has no children. It's, it's mostly on Hannah that we're going to focus here in the next few minutes. <clears throat> we know from reading commentaries and all the lexicons that the Levite men are number one in all the world for devotion to family and faith. And so, God bless him, Elkanah does what he can. Now, it's, it's a very unfortunate happenstance inside this, this lovely home, or to figure a nice, comfortable home, that Penina, the one that has children, is all the time mercilessly provoking Hannah because she has no child, because the Lord has closed her womb. And Hannah, when we go through the, the rest of the story towards the end, becomes more and more bitter and sad and despondent and in great despair in her heart because she has no children. When you make these first impressions, and my first impression, by the way, of Hannah is that she's a lovely woman and that she's got it made. She, she has this really wonderful house got a husband who adores her, and she's free mostly from the responsibility of taking care of the youngsters, the infants, you know, wiping the infants' noses and, you know, other, other body parts, and, and she's free from that. But no, that's not what's important to her. The one thing that she wants in this whole lifetime has been deprived her. She wants to become a what? A mother. She wants to become a mother. I'm not going to tell you my first impression of Penina because we want to keep this positive as much as possible. You know? and, but she, she provokes, they refer to her as her rival. Some, some versions call it a foe. I don't know what they would call each other, 
if they were introducing themselves or something, you know, because the husband's still a husband, this wife, this wife is still a wife. But the other wife, it just, like I said, we just, we just can't, maybe it's wife and law, I don't know. But we can't, we can't conceive of that, you know. So my first impression of Hannah is wrong. And that's okay. I, I've, I've been wrong before. So, so my first impression was wrong. And I can deal with it. I recall many years ago, many decades ago, as a matter of fact, I took some photography classes at the Georgia Center. And among the, the technical and, and the real articulate kind of things that you do with the camera and printing and this kind of thing, it goes a little bit farther when you start looking at a print. We, 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 had, we had actually classes on how to look at an image, how to look at a print, a photo, or a, or a painting, or a sketch. And among the things they teach you was there is a point of focus that takes you there first. The very first thing you see in this particular image, and that's, that's the POF, the point of focus. And then theoretically, your eye goes in circles around until you take in the entire image. And so I want to tell you about this one, this one painting. I used to go to galleries after I learned that. And, and I learned that people, you know, people would go stand in front of, of an image. They'd put their hands behind their back. And, and a lot of times they would just rock up on their toes. So I did that when I would go to a gallery because I want them to think, you know, I'm a real discerning museum over here. So I look at this one painting. It's called Hope. It simply has a title of Hope underneath it in capital letters. And the thing that drew me to it first, this young woman sitting out in a meadow in a rocking chair playing a harp. And I thought, now, now that's a positive first impression. And I began to look a little farther as he, on her skin were, were bruises and scrapes. And then and suddenly I realized that her clothes are all torn and tattered, you know. And of all things, I looked down and the left side rocker on that rocking chair is busted and just laying there loosely. It's not even a viable rocking chair. Uh, and I began to keep looking. Around the entire painting is little dreamlike vignettes of of war and pestilence and fighting and, and just awful stuff. And I began to think, where do you get the title for hope for this? Because I don't see hope. Then, wouldn't you know it, I noticed that all of the strings on this harp are broken except one. There's only one, one string on the harp. I just don't get it. So, like I said, my, my first impression was wrong, and that's okay. Now, but so what I want to go into here is what Elkanah, being a Levite, and, and wanting to pay attention not only to family, but also to faith, every year, they go over to Shiloh, a few miles northeast of here, and to worship and to sacrifice and to take care of their spiritual well-being and make plans for their spiritual well-being for the following year. And people from all over that they have known, family and friends, and they haven't seen them since last year. So people from all around gather at this place in Shiloh. And it's interesting, it's like a reunion that is just so much fun. It's just so delightful to think about seeing these people and all of these hugs and all this other kind of stuff. But the big thing is, and I can't help thinking that everybody <laughs> brings food. That there's this covered dish, you know, so they got all these nice casseroles and things. And I don't care what you say about the ecclesial spirit of this or or the planning for your spiritual well-being. It just it just comes that one that maybe the big highlight is we're gonna eat. And it's just really exciting that they're putting these things together, the food, you know. Well, it seems like it's the same women most of the time when they put these things together that they're organized to the hilt. They start out in the in the beginning of the tables with 
the plates and the hardware, and then on down some salads and, and some main dish, some garden fresh vegetables, you know, some casseroles, and, and, and you know, all, and, and you know, everybody doesn't always stay home and do a lot of work prepared. Some, some stop on the way and pick up a bucket of chicken, you know? And that is quite all right, because it's hardly ever left over. So, so that's a part of what we're gonna to eat too. And then the desserts and then the tea, you know? Sweet and unsweet and decaf, and, and they're just all organized. And it jumps off of the page at you really vigorously that Hannah is feeling the worst that she has in a long time, and she does not eat. I just can't conceive of that either with all of that food here, and she's not going to eat. But everybody lines up, that's what they're going to do, and she takes this opportunity, we're told, that she can go on down the hill now, quietly and unnoticed, and enter the tabernacle of Jehovah, and she's come straight down to the altar. Now, Eli is taking his turn, old Eli. You know, my first impression of Eli is not that good. But here he is sitting in one of those straight back chairs, you know, leaning back on two legs with his chin down on his chest, hoping nobody comes in here. But he sees Hannah come down and kneel at the altar. And she makes a vow, we're told, she prays fervently to the Lord. O Lord of hosts, she says. And by the way, we're told that this is the first time the Lord of hosts, as a phrase, is used as a title for God. And it's used many, many times after that, the Lord of hosts. In fact, Samuel, who will enter the story later on, used the Lord of hosts quite a bit. She says, O Lord of hosts, she says, If you will remember me, your maid servant, if you will give me a man child, I will give him back to your service all the days of his life, and no razor will ever touch his head. Now, this thing with a razor is, is, is mentioning the Nazarites. You heard the Nazarites. This is a group of people that make this special sort of a covenant with God, and they have these, these covenants, and they have these restrictions that they go through, and they don't cut their hair. So, so she's referring to, he will become a Nazarite. He will become, you know, greatly, greatly given towards the service of God for all of his life. And for that amount of time that he makes that vow, he will not cut his hair. <clears throat> now, Eli, sitting in his chair, stands up, and he sees her, and he thinks that she's drunk. And what I want to do now is read the next seven verses, 12 through 18, and, this, and this, take this story to its conclusion. Verse 12, it happened as she continued to move her lips. She was praying in silence. Her heart was about to burst with all of that was in it. And she was praying fervently in silence, but her lips were moving. She was forming the word. So Eli thought she was drunk. He said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. And Hannah answered right away, no, my Lord. I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. <coughs> Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and my grief have I spoken until now. And Eli answered and said to her, Go in peace. And the God of Israel grant your petition, which you have asked of him. And then she said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way 
back to the table and she ate and her face from that point on was no longer sad. And she moves her lips. For some reason, he thinks that she's drunk and he confronts her. And thank God this woman had the fortitude to defend herself. No, do not think that of me because out of, out of the despair of my heart have I spoken until now. Eli gives what I think is maybe the most powerful blessing and benediction in all of the Holy Writ. And he says, go in peace and the God of Israel grant that petition which you have asked of him. Now I'm not kidding you when I say you hear orchestral music coming at you when this happens. She stands up and we're told that her face is no longer sad. And during this time, they didn't finish eating up there on the hill. So she went back up there and she got her plate and she started eating. I, I feel like she, she ate like my boy did when he was 18. I think she really, really took the food in because now her life has changed so strongly. My first impression of Eli was wrong, and I'm grateful for that. Because isn't it powerful what he came through, and he gave her this blessing, and she knew then that her prayer had been heard. <clears throat> You have to read real, real close between the lines to see this. But when she rejoined her husband at the top of the hill and they got through with, with the day and then they started back home, they stopped by a mall to do a little looking at baby furniture because they knew right then. They knew beyond knowing that God had answered her prayer. <clears throat> and that she would have a son. And, and, and I commend the rest of that reading to you because she did have that and she took, some, she took some time with him before she fulfilled her promise, but she did. And she gave him back to the Lord God for service for all of his life. And I don't want to be a spoiler, but I do want you to read it. But she did go and visit him in, in the, the tabernacle quite a bit. She sold the stuff for him. She made him clothes and things and brought him to her. But, but only, only a mother would make a covenant like that to have that son and then give him to the Lord God. And she did that. She was a mother. Oh, on this painting, When I kept looking in a circular motion, finally I see above the harp musical notes, tiny, perfectly shaped musical notes wafting up from that harp through the clouds to the very throne of God. This woman had the audacity to not give up hope when everything seemed to be taken away from her and she had one string left, but she made musical notes to God, praise to God with that one, one string that she had left. Can we do that? Could we? And we've been through times of despair. We've had times when our heart was about to, we, We've had times when the despair was just about to take over us and we get to about as low as you can go. Can we do that? Can we take that one string that we might have left 
and commune with the lord of hosts let it be so